Hello, I'm Katie Jarvis, and this week, Real Foot Forward is made possible by our friends at Mahindra of Ken 10. When you are ready to invest in a new tractor, mower, or implement attachment, their friendly and knowledgeable staff are prepared to make sure your experience is outstanding. Welcome to Real Foot Forward from Discovery Park of America, located up here in the corner of beautiful West Tennessee. Every day at our museum and heritage park, we inspire children and adults to see beyond. And each week, we do the same thing here on our podcast. This episode is special because it is the first time we have recorded in front of a live studio audience. Today, Scott is with Wes Collier and Randy DeWeese. Thank you, Katie. I'm Scott Williams, host of Real Foot Forward, where each week, just like at our museum and heritage park here in Union City, Tennessee, we explore the culture, the spirit, the accomplishments, and the heritage of West Tennessee. We thought this would be a really fun episode because today is our annual tracker show, and collectors are here from all over the nation. Um, and as a special treat, I have two very respected and well-known collectors here with me for this episode. So if the incredible studio audience would help me welcome Randy DeWeese and Wes Collier. Thank you for coming today, guys. I really appreciate it. First of all, Will, um, you tell us a little bit about um, yourself, Randy, and um, where you came from, what your background was, and then we'll talk to Wes. Yeah, I'm Randy DeWeese, and I live in Clinton, Kentucky. I was <clears throat> actually born in right around Moscow, Kentucky, which is about 20 miles north of here. Born and raised on a farm and continue to farm and work outside and with tractors, new and old, every day. Excellent. How about you, Wes? So I was born and raised in Fulton, Kentucky, uh, on the family farm, and we still uh, are on that family farm, and um, I was fortunate enough to get farming in my blood. It's never left. Uh, so even, even when I left and went to college, uh, as soon as I was finished with that, I came back to the farm as quick as I could. Now, um, let's really quickly jump right into just your tractor collections. Each one of you are collectors. Um, Wes, we'll start with you. Will you tell us a little bit about the collection that you have? Sure. It started with my, uh, the tractors that I grew up with when I was uh, 10 years old and, and, and younger that my grandfather bought uh, new. There was three of them. And uh, myself and my brothers all grew up farming the ground with those tractors and we all three uh, developed a love for those tractors. And uh, later on in my life, when the collecting bug started, it, it, was, it was kicked off by those tractors. We would load those tractors up and take them to, to shows around the country uh, when I was growing up and, and in my early 20s. And I, I just realized I, I was a tractor lover and a, and a collector at heart. And, and uh, my wife and I have, have been collecting now for 30 years. And so you have, you know, roughly how many approximate tractors do you have in your collection? Approximately 20. And you have like a big barn that you keep them in? Several, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, is, uh, what is your favorite, your Pride and Joy tractor? Uh, the Pride and Joy tractor is a 2850 Hart Par that was bought out of a wine vineyard in California. What makes that one uh, special to you? Well, first of all, the, I've only seen a handful of those, and of the handful that I've seen, only a only a couple have had the factory cab on it, which this one does. And uh, my wife was born and raised in Charles City, Iowa, which is where the Hart Par factory was. And so most, most of the male members of her family worked at the Hart Par factory and the Oliver uh, factory uh, along with it. And so uh, we feel like we have a family tied to that name. And so we, we've got a, a, a super rare Hart Par with a cool story of how, we, of how it wound up at our farm. How about you, Randy? The farm I grew up on had my grandfather's tractors there as well. Um, they weren't operating, they were parked, and, and they were that way for years and years until I was almost an adult. And I decided it was time to do something with them and got to playing with them. And, and, uh, but those tractors being there to climb on and, and turn the steering wheel when I was a kid sparked the interest, and I would go around and, and pick up tractors out of other people's barns and other people's fence rows and other people's scrap piles that were going to be discarded and uh, just started gathering stuff up. <clears throat> and that just kept growing and growing and, and uh, 
the numbers aren't so great. Probably 20, depending on how you count them, running, not running parts, uh, hopefuls, you know, uh, pipe dreams. But And you have a big you have a big barn also where you have them all stored? We have big a big building. We have them scattered in several buildings. There, when I was uh, doing a little research about the topic of uh, tractor shows and tractor collecting, I ran across uh, Dr. James Shepard from Defuniac Springs, Florida, who apparently has one of the largest collections. Um, and somebody asked him why he collected, and he said, um, I kept badgering my dad to get rid of the mules, and about the time I turned 12 years old, my dad traded the mules in and got a John Deere tractor. This single instrument moved us out of the pits of poverty into prosperity, and I think that's the reason I have such a fondness for old tractors. Um, do you find that to be the case when you're at shows and you're talking to people? Do, do, is there stories behind, is there emotion behind why people are attracted to collecting tractors? Yes, there is. There, there's always um, either a family link or a or, or a memory from childhood. This is this this tractor here that that we're looking at is just like the one my grandfather had, and I drove it when I was 12, and I can't believe I'm looking at it again. There's always some connection. Usually, there's always some connection. There and there might be just a respect uh, from a person who didn't grow up on a tractor uh, around the farm, if you will, uh, a respect for what they're looking at and and from you know what. The, the agricultural industry did in this country uh, in the 20th century. How about you? Do you hear stories? A lot of it uh, has to do with the people involved as well. When you go to these shows across the country and you go to the same show year after year and you develop friendships, uh, lifelong friendships of people you never see but once a year. And uh, that kind of grows on you. And, and your interest very, you know, they teach you something else or they show you a, a different model or a newer or an older version and it just you know, it just you just keep getting deeper into it. The other thing, like you say, I like the real early tractors, and I see people go around and they're like, "Well, that's what I grew up on," and that you know, and the, the tractors that I grew up on, I didn't think were old. But now that I'm getting older, I look back and I'm like, "Well, man, that's what I drove when I was a kid. That is interesting." You know, to, back then it was just a just a machine. Yeah. So now it's you know from from new to old. I, I read that uh, the value of the oldest tractors are decreasing slightly while the value of the tractors that people um, our age drove when they were younger, like you said, are increasing in value because that's, people want to collect what they remember from their childhood. I don't know if that's true or not. Speaking of the business of tractor collecting, so um, do either of you actually resell the ones that you have in your collection and try to buy a different one or do you just collect them and keep them? I'm more of a keeper. I have gotten rid of a few things at times <clears throat> either to finance another one or somebody wanted it I thought would be a good home and let it go but for the most part I'm, I'm a collector. I don't ever think about the value if it's a tractor that I think I want I go after it and try to get it if it's you know if it's a $500 tractor or whatever it is. Um, the value of them doesn't really enter my mind. I just love the, the tractors for what they are. How about you? I, I, we've never sold a tractor that we bought. Okay, you buy it and you hang on to it. I, it's it's a, unfortunate almost in that uh, if, if something catches our eyes because we like it and it doesn't seem to go away over time. So we like the ones we've acquired and, and we've never really thought about selling them. So I'm sure that you go to shows all over the country and you see uh, tractors for sale and, and you've probably sold some. Um, is there a business model for that kind of thing? There are people that do that. And there are people that actually can do that for a living, mm -hmm. whether they're what I call just a jockey where they buy and sell what's there or whether they buy and restore and sell, you know, what they've restored. Uh, there's people involved in it in the parts business. You know, there, there's a lot of people that make their money in the antique tractor business. I saw a guy today here has a trailer where he's selling parts and things like that. So, um, you but you mentioned a while ago the culture of the shows, and and I'm fast. I'm always fascinated by uh, niche uh, cultures, and um, the tractor show folks seem to all know each other, and there seems to be a normal way they know how to do what they do. They set tents up behind the. You know, can, can you tell us a little bit about what the tractor show world is like for those of us like me who have never, this is my first uh, tractor show. So uh, what, what's the world like for, for those of you that go and partake of this hobby? There's so many great friends that you meet 
like I say, and you get to know them, and, and sometimes you don't see them but once a year. But I tried to walk up the sidewalk out here with my wife and my grandson, and my grandson finally told me to quit talking to people. So, you know, everybody, everybody we passed we knew from years past and stopped and visited. So. And so do you, do you spend the night at these things usually? I mean, I notice people have tents. Do you stay in a hotel? Is that better? I've never done an overnight show. I've, it's, I've always done the ones that, um, that you can drive to and get back in one day. But there are those shows who have uh, primitive camping and uh, some of the larger shows that draw a more widespread audience. Uh, I'm sure you, it's going to involve a hotel stay. So tell me, what is the biggest and best tractor show in the nation? If you're talking about tractors, I would have to go with Rolog, Minnesota, uh, just because the variety and, the, and they go from early to old. From uh, If you get into the gas engine end of it, it's Portland, Indiana. So I know that it's not just a broad subject of tractors. What are the different categories at the, at the different shows? Well, you have, uh, you, what you tend to see a lot at, at, at tractor shows is the 1950, 1960 vintage uh, tractor with electric start on rubber tires. That's, that's the easiest thing to handle, the easiest thing to maneuver with at the show, trailer, get it off the trailer. But you also see a lot of stationary engines, uh, large and small. Uh, you, see, you can see a lot of tractors on steel wheels. Uh, you can see prairie style tractors, which are extremely large, weigh 15, 20,000 pounds, and uh, with you know, rear wheels on there seven feet tall, are uh, steam engines. Uh, big, old stationary power units that are that are mounted to a, a fixed, a fixed um, place. Uh, so there's there's several different things you can run into at a tractor show. And um, what if what if you what what actual tractor do you have here? Each of you have here today at this show. I've got my grandfather's 1937 W30 McCormick Deering that he bought brand new. Wow. That's great. That's got a great family tie to it. Yes, it does. And how about yours? I have two International Harvester gasoline engine hit and miss engines, both one horsepower. One's a Titan Junior and one's a Titan. Small uh, household type engines. Now, you, you two are experts in this, so if I decided today I wanted to start collecting tractors, um, and I'm sure somebody has been seen your collection and gotten excited and decided to start collecting. What advice do you give somebody who's going to uh, start start uh, investing in tractors? Get your wife involved. <laughs> Excellent answer. Having the family behind you helps because you know if if you're going to go to shows and if you're going to do this on the weekend and you know they're thinking about the lake or they're thinking about a ball game or they're thinking about all this other stuff. You need to get your family. Try to get them involved. Some have better luck at that than others. You know, but. But the other thing is, is, you know, start small and work your way into it. Get something that's, that's relatively cheap, easy to work on, or, or if you're not going to work on it, at least already painted and, and ready to go, you know. How about you, Wes? I would echo the uh, start small and don't overwhelm yourself with multiple projects. I, I would say probably get something that's relatively new enough that finding parts on the Internet wouldn't be too difficult, uh, like maybe 1950s vintage and uh, lightweight so it's easily trailered and um, and I hate to say this but if you could get one with electric start it would it would might eliminate a lot of frustration for you so when I was up in the tower a while ago and I was looking down at all the tractors lined up it it dawned on me that they're all different colors and and so I was curious uh, is there a meaning behind uh, the particular colors, or did one company get it and that became known as their brand? Like, for example, John Deere, everybody knows is green. You know, how did, how did the different colors come about? It's become a trademark of sorts for these brands. The only one I know of, for sure, from what I've read and, and studied, is the International Harvester Red in 37, I think. They, they had a gray tractor with red wheels, and for safety reasons, the, the administration of that company decided to go all red for safety reasons, people could see it better. And then I've been told Alice Chandler did the same thing with orange. And that's the only two I know any specifics on. Now, um, Katie told me a fact about white tractors. I don't know if it's true or not. The Farmall. The Farmall tractors, the white one, meant that the salesman was coming into town. He would have it white on his, his trailer, and then that was the, so people would know that it was a salesperson. Demonstrator tractors. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, so see, that, that's true, Katie. Good job. <laughs> of course not. Um, so um, do you, either of you have uh, children following in your collector footsteps? We actually have a young lady here today in the audience who was just telling us about how she has a tractor here. What's your name? And I'll say your name. Hannah. Hannah ha Hannah's our youngest, probably, collector here, and she's got a tractor out there. So um, are you passing it, passing it along, the collecting spirit? Neither one of my children have shown any deep-rooted interest in this at, this at this time. How about you? Mine tend to tolerate me, and they help when I ask, and, and they, they've been somewhat involved over the years, but to... You know, I don't think they lay awake at night and think about it. Think about tractors? <laughs> no. Yeah, it's interesting how that works, isn't it? And then there's a young lady over here who's a, who's a, a collector. That's fascinating. Um, thank you guys so much for doing this for us. I really appreciate it. Um, bef before I let you go, um, I do want to find out, of course, we have an annual tractor show every year. So um, how does the Discovery Park of America tractor show stack up next to some of the other ones that you've been to? It certainly is well represented. Uh, there's people that come in from quite a distance. And anytime you have uh, over 100 tractors, uh, I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know the count. It's, there's, there's a bunch of tractors out there. Um, it's very well yeah. attended. There's 157 out there today. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's right up there with, with the best around here. Excellent. I think the variety here is just spectacular. You know, I, I walk down through there, and there's, I'm sure there's brands that aren't here. But not many brands that aren't here and it's and uh, the facilities here is just wonderful uh the my wife grandson can come in here and get a little air conditioning and enjoy the museum part the the, the other parts of the park here it just makes i think a wonderful show and i you know it's different than most of the tractor shows we go to because they've been in business long enough they're, and they're you know the the people running it are the people involved in it mm -hmm. Uh, so, but it's really a good thing, and I hope it continues to go. I, I would, if I had a chance, I'd vote for it to be here every year and, and uh, just make, try to make it better. Excellent. That's exactly what we plan on doing. Well, thank you guys so much for doing this. Um, our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond, and I have no doubt you guys have done that. And now here's Andrew with something else to discover among the collections here at our Museum and Heritage Park. Thank you, Scott. I am Andrew Gibson with the Education Department here at Discovery Park of America. And today I am with David Heathcott, a docent here at the park, um, who will be telling us more about Alan Curing. So, David, I'll go ahead. Okay. Um, I, read, uh, I read in the papers the other day the, the very interesting news that uh, Alan Turing is uh, to be honored on the British 50-pound note in uh I, had, uh, I see uh, Alan Turing's name in our museum every day, and I wanted to talk about Alan Turing. Uh, Alan Turing was born in 1912, and uh, he, uh, he wore many hats. He was a mathematician, a computer scientist, and a cryptographer. And he actually invented the Turing machine. Now, don't ask me what the Turing machine does, because I'm just not smart enough to understand it. But uh, he, he was a genius. I mean, he truly is a genius. And like any uh, genius, he was eccentric. He did some strange things. Uh, he rode a bike everywhere, and uh, even a long ways. He rode, he rode his bike, and he once uh, took all his life savings and buried it in a jar and then proceeded to forget where he'd put the jar. So then he was back to being, being a poor genius. But uh, uh, in, in uh, 1939, he was working with, uh, with Bletchley Park, and he was uh, working on the Enigma machine. Now, the Enigma sh machine was a German cipher machine, and it was used for communications uh, with all branches of the German military. And uh, he, he was attached to Bletchley Park, or the also known as the Government Code and Cipher School, and this was where uh, they were working to break the Enigma system. He, uh, he developed a version of the Polish bomb, and let me explain what a bomb was. And the bomb uh, could simulate hundreds of Enigma machines. The, the Enigma machine, uh, it was an electromechanical machine, and uh, it, looked, it looked like a typewriter. It looked like a wooden typewriter, it, it, and, except it didn't have any punctuation marks, and the, uh, 
the keyboard looked strange to Americans because it was a German t- style keyboard. And so uh, the way it worked was uh, uh, you had uh, what was called rotors, and they were filled with electrical contacts. And you had, at one point, you had five that you could choose from. The code book would tell you which ones to use and where to put them. And so you would set that on the machine. And then you also had, at the very front, you had what looked like an old telephone switchboard with with, uh, jumper cables running from one plug to the other. Okay, the code book would tell you how to set them. And then it would give you the... uh, it would give you the starting uh, the starting positions for the rotors, and you say, I, I, usually when I explain this, for some reason, I always use the letter R. So you type in the letter R, okay, and the letter R would uh, would go through the plug board, and, it, and depending on what uh, uh, it was jumper cable to, it would come out a different letter. And then it would go to the rotors. It would go into one rotor, say, as a B, uh, go into the next rotor, be a D, and go to the next one, be maybe a G, and then it would turn around and come back again, and each time, it's, it, changed, it changed the letter. The letter became a different letter. And uh, then it would go back through the uh, plug board, and then finally it would light up a little light. It didn't type anything. A stenographer had to, had to stand beside the operator with a, with a, uh, a notepad and, and record the message. Okay, and, and, uh, and once you had done that, that was your enciphered message. You know, and it would be transmitted by Morse code or whatever. And uh, the, re- the receiving station... Uh, the way it, the machine worked, they would have to have their machine set exactly the same way. And uh, here's where the here's where it gets uh, complicated because there was 158 trillion different ways to set the machine, and this was all in accordance with the code book. When the codes changed every night, and everybody in a particular network would have to have their their machine set to the same settings, or otherwise it came out as complete gibberish. But uh, the problem for uh, for uh, with Enigma was it, it had a couple of weaknesses. One, say our our our, our letter R, uh, it would never encipher as itself. Another problem was that uh, since it, it never enciphered a letter as itself, uh, the code breaker could use what was uh, was called a uh, a crib, which was a, a, a uh, what they called a plain a known plain text attack. Uh, if if it was being sent to a to a, say a, a tank unit. Uh, it, the the address would be in in the clear, so they could they knew it was for them, and uh, and then you'd have a pretty good idea there'd be like Panzer somewhere in there. So you take your 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 printed out crib, and you start sliding it along the the enciphered message, and if the same letter lined up, then you know that there, that didn't say Panzer, and so you moved on until you found something that worked, and that would actually give you that would actually eliminate a, a great percentage of the uh, of the possible settings. And so what uh, Alan Turing did was uh, there would still be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of possible settings. And so the bomb, uh, he basically improved on uh, something that the Poles had built. And the Poles had been uh, reading uh, Enigma traffic for, uh, since 1932 because basically they were between Russia and Germany. And, and every time they get uh, upset with each other, then Poland winds up being invaded. So the, the Poles were very, uh, very invested in in. Uh, in uh, discovering the secrets of Enigma, and when war was about to break out in 1939, they uh, they gave what they had to to the British, and so uh, uh, he he developed an improved an improved bomb that basically simulated a whole bunch of Enigma machines, and it could try all the settings, and if one happened on the on the proper setting for the day, then it would stop. And then you'd put that into the an Enigma machine, and if it came out in, in in clean plain text, then you knew you were you were in the system for the day, and you could start uh, deciphering messages. But uh, uh, post war, uh, Turing uh, uh, still did a lot of science. He actually became uh, involved in biology, but uh, he had a secret, and uh, his secret was that he was he was a homosexual, and uh, uh, he came to the attention of the British police uh, somehow and with one of his friends, I'll call him, uh, I think had uh, destroyed his apartment. So, the, so the, British, the British police came to see what was up. And so they get to looking at this at Mr. Turing and something, uh, something seems fishy. And so they investigate his, uh, his uh, military background. And he has none, nothing, because he was, he was uh, subject to the... Uh, to the uh, National Secrets Act, he could not say anything under penalty of being locked up in prison, so he couldn't tell him what he'd been doing. 
And so he was, uh, he was offered the option of jail time or chemical castration. And, uh, and uh, he took the chemical castration, and uh, two years later, he was, uh, he was found dead, and there was a, an apple that was uh, soaked in cyanide with one bite taken out of it uh, laying near his body. And uh, if you've ever uh, owned anything from Apple Computer, one, it's called Apple because of, uh, of Alan Turing, and it has a bite out of it because of Alan Turing. It was a, a sly salute to one of the pioneers of uh, early computers. So I know our listeners, just like myself, discovered something new today. Uh, so, David, thank you so much for coming on and sharing this bit of information with us. Um, and once again, thank you all for listening to uh, the Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast. And we hope to see you all here at Discovery Park real soon. Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave your review on iTunes or wherever you may be listening. Plan your own adventure to see beyond at Discovery Park of America by visiting discoveryparkofamerica.com. Be sure to also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates.